Good morning and good day to all of you. Uh, I am Manu Jindal, Barrister and Solicitor Canada and Advocate in India. Welcome you all. This is our second batch of foundation and first class. We are taking this first class. I have the opportunity to welcome you all. And you have spared your valuable time on the weekend. I am really very thankful to all of you. So the point which I want to make is I have already like uh, written in the group that uh, please come prepared with the printed bear. I always emphasize the words that uh, bear act, sorry, I have used the bear act printed syllabus. Printed syllabus is necessary not only for the class, but also for the exam. This is the only exam where if you do not carry the syllabus with you in the exam, you may not pass. I will not say that you, you are not to pass, but if you do not carry the syllabus, printed syllabus with you, of course, uh, many things I would ask you to write upon the syllabus. If you do not carry the printed syllabus with you in the exam, it is hard to pass the exam. I will tell you how. because. In the exam, by the time you will choose that what is the main topic, it you may come to the conclusion after writing half the question or quarter to question or full question even, that examiner was looking for something else. There only one thing can help you in the exam, that is syllabus. And if you have taken short notes on syllabus, they are more helpful to you in the exam. So my humble request to all of you that you should carry or you must carry printed syllabus both in the class and in the exam. Only then you can pass foundation of Canadian laws. Now, let us start with one thing. That IREC was the formula for three exams. For NCA three exams, constitution, criminal law, and administrative law. But as far as uh, this foundations of Canadian law and professional responsibility are concerned, no IREC is required. You can opt for it, but I never recommend IREC is, or NCA never recommends that NCA me IREC methodology should be adopted. Anybody is having any questions? Somebody was trying to unmute and come forward so that we may start. Okay, let me say you a few more things about NCA Foundation of Canadian Law exam. Henceforth, I will be call, calling it as foundation. In foundation, first thing. To attempt any exam question, you may jot down, you may write down in your notebooks. You are to identify the main topic. First. Second, you need to identify the minor topic. If possible, you need to identify which legal theory is applicable. First is main topic. Second is minor topic. Third is legal theory. Fourth is case law. Fifth is bonus marks. What is bonus marks? If you know views of any author, then it is always welcome in the exam by the examiner that he has reserved few marks, maybe two, three, four, or as bonus marks for you. So five things I would repeat. First, you have to choose the main topic. Then you have to choose the minor topic. Then you have to see for the legal theory. Then also you have to see which case law is applicable. Then of course the bonus marks, if you know any of the authors who has strong views about it, particular topic as per the given facts in the exam, then of course you can quote it and get the bonus marks. So 
this is the theory which you have to keep in mind while attempting the foundation exam. Now let us go one by one that what is main topic, what is minor topic. Major topic is that what exactly the examiner is looking for. I will give you one instance. Rule of law. You will find in the syllabus in chapter number three or four, I am not giving you exact chapter number, rule of law. In rule of law is applicable in every question. It can be a major topic, but major topic can be elsewise. So, rule of law, generally speaking, can be a minor topic. Meaning thereby, you have to identify what the examiner is looking for in whole of the question with whom you are to correlate rest of the things. What are the rest of the things? The minor topic, the legal theory, if anything applies, then comes the case laws, then comes the articles given in the syllabus or say any author you know who has got strong views about the same perception which the examiner might have in his mind. And let me see you another thing. In uh, all other exams, maybe any other exam, generally that is based on the experience, either you will score good marks, means to say you will pass, or you will fail, you will say you are not knowing but in foundation exam, I have seen many students above 40 marks who are failed. 50 is the passing marks. And NCA, evaluator of your exam, written answer sheet, stops checking your exam once you score 50 marks. But God forbids, if you score less than 50 marks, then he, is to, he or she is to write your failure. That failure report is sent to you that where you were lacking in writing your exam. So, generally saying in foundation exams, I am not making any of you afraid of it. But still I am saying it's a very, very ticklish examination and many failures are of 45, 46, 47. 44 to 49 are the failure marks of good students. So you have to take every exam, but this exam in particular, very, very seriously and carefully. For me, this is my personal view. You may have your different view after studying the whole uh, foundations that it happens to be the hardest among all the NCA subjects. Little bit boring as well. But I will try to make it interesting for all of you. And my another suggestion to all of you, you kindly take deep interest in every topic. I, I teach you in the class. For the simple reason, if you won't, later on you may not be able to understand. And believe me, it's a very, very lengthy syllabus. There are uh, 30 case laws, prescribed case laws. 10 chapters, 30 case laws, 22 articles. These all are not from my own pocket. These all are prescribed by the NCA. You can count in the syllabus I've, I have posted in the group. I repeat, 30 case laws, 22 articles, 10 chapters. So, lot of material is... Let us talk about first chapter. First chapter has three prescribed case laws, one article. One article by Robert, uh, Robin, Arrested Injustice. Apart from that, 
I am to give you six case laws. So total nine in first chapter itself. But you need not to mug up anything. As I told yesterday in my constitutional law class, I must tell you that you will have access to every sort of printed material in this exam as well. You can have your books if required. You can have your notes. You can have your cheat sheets. You can have your slips. You can arrange them in any manner. Watched by two cameras. One is, one is of your laptop. Another is of your mobile. But you can have anything. So you need not to stress your mind. But why I am telling you all this? Because you need to keep it in mind. Generally, the tutors or the persons who teaches you tells you during the exam watch. But I am the person who is telling you on the very first day in first class that this much big syllabus is there. You must know the structure. Once you know the structure, then you will be able to grasp all the things. If this thing is told to you a few days before the exams, you will be worried. But if you know it from the very first day, you will be preparing yourself according to the requirement of the exam. That is my way of telling you that this much syllabus is there. Of course, if I go on counting the concepts, there are hundreds of concepts in this foundation of Canadian law foundation we popularly call it. So lastly, before I start with the first chapter, I would again request you always carry at the cost of reputation, I am saying, always carry printed syllabus with you. If you have printed syllabus, you can open up the syllabus. Even I am teaching, I have read many a times this foundation. I have this syllabus with me. This printed syllabus is with me and you may be see, seeing that I have made highlights with different colors. I have made small notes. If you keep on checking it, on every page I have done. Because keeping in view the length of the subject foundation, you have to do all the things. And let me say you one last thing before I start the chapter one. Once you know the technique, once you know the methodology, once you know that what is contained in every chapter, then the whole notes which I will be providing you are there to help you in the exam because everything will be on your tips. You can have paper tags, plastic tags written upon it that tag to your examination or answer material then you can easily, because in the laxity of time, you will have a quick pickup of the page, have a grasp of the thing, then put it into the typing, into the exam. So that's all. Once you put everything, you are bound to pass. And let me say you one, another thing, last another thing, that if you Feel confident from the very first day. No NC exam is difficult. I will give you yesterday, I given my own example. Again, I am giving my example in today's class as well. I attempted all NC exams. I cleared first time, first go. Let me say you one another thing that I cleared barrister and solicitor exam in first go. For, with the only reason that my teachers were very good. I'm really indebted to them. They taught me well. I studied well and I cleared all with confidence. I was sure when I came out of the examination hall, I came out of my own room of, after giving the online exams, I given all online exams that I will surely pass. I have no hesitation. I closed my books. I only opened my books, even of foundation, once I started teaching. Otherwise, everything is my, was in my mind, and I was quite sure that I will pass. Same will be with me. And I never want that no, every, anybody should fail. 
as I told you, this is like a second batch of mine. In first batch, whosoever appeared, because there were many students who never appeared, for the simple reason, because they were waiting their assessment. So whosoever appeared passed. Even there were few students who appeared second or third time in foundation. And they complimented me that uh, when they were attempting the exam questions, my words were in their mind that it was very easy for them to pick up the main topic, pick up the uh, minor topic and put the case laws. And today, the NCA has a passion of asking the uh, short answer type question in foundation. During our times, it was not. But nowadays, NC is also asking short answer type questions. What I'm trying to say is, by telling you little format of the paper, that NCA is trying to go behind your brains. They want to see whether you have flipped every page of your syllabus, every article of yours, even in the last exam, which held previous months, they ask certain questions from within the articles. So generally people leave the articles. And once, I will give you examples, one we will uh, like ponder upon the things in the syllabus, that from where it happened. But believe me, the persons who have gone through all the articles, all the prescribed case laws, they were having no difficulty, practically no difficulty in attempting the exam. Of course, they had to be considerate, they had to be fast, they have to be methodological, they have to be time managers for their own self. Now, say me last thing. I have told you five minutes back the last thing. Now, it is practically the last. Believe in yourself, be positive, and let us start chapter number one. If any question, tell date, tell time, sorry. You are welcome to ask. Other we have spent daily, we will be spending five to ten minutes in revision, but every time we will be starting there and then. So if anybody has got any question, please. Anything which comes to the mind? Okay. Let us start with chapter number one. You can unmute yourself. You can stop me in between. If you do not understand, I will try, try that you should understand. But still, if I'm not clear, I may be wrong. I am repeating it. Yesterday also I told you, you can stop me in between. You can have your own viewpoint. You can propagate your viewpoint, but you have to justify what you are saying. So, in the interest of the class, I will always be uh, time sensitive, but still, you can unmute yourself and always ask me that what I told you, or you may give your own opinion, because this is the subject of giving opinion on different concepts. So, let us start chapter number one, theories of law, legal theories. Basic theories of law, racism and the law. This is the syllabus. I would like to read the syllabus first. I told you that this is the paper where syllabus is required. Chapter number one, basic theories of law, racism and law. Positivism and natural law. Feminist perspectives on law. Critical legal studies. Law and economics. Required readings, chapter 2 of 4 say, prescribed cases R versus Morris 2021 decided by Ontario Court of Appeal. Then second case is Canada Incorporation versus Shefford Plaza 2021 again Ontario Court of Appeal. R versus Gladue 1999 decided by Honorable Supreme Court of Canada. Then article by Robert, uh, sorry, Robin arrested injustice from the streets to the prisons in pulsing 
black lives state violence in canada from slavery to the present you may be astonished from one aspect this all this syllabus is available with you why i am reading i'm just trying to tell you that you should well the habit of reading this syllabus why so once exam question will be before you and you have read every word of your syllabus it will strike in your mind that this is pertaining to critical are pure somebody is calling somebody not are you are you bheji okay i will mute him anyway it's good that somebody is calling but i am good i am with you okay let us start with chapter number 1 chapter number 1 we have read we have well the habit of reading the syllabus if we will have the habit of reading the syllabus you will see that once it will be clubbed all together with 30 cases 22 case last 10 chapters hundreds of concept it will not be difficult for you people to recall any topic now let us concentrate upon theories of law legal theories what are legal theories how we interpret the law what is going in the back of our mind what is going in the back of the mind of the judge adjudicator this is something theoretical aspect of the law this is what this chapter is talking about how laws are interpreted this is the theme of this chapter how laws are made or interpreted how law comes into existence let us go by it legislature makes the law long procedure in the making of the law people speak in parliament provincial legislatures lot about every provision of law some are willing to have it some are not willing to have it all are public representatives everybody has got his or her own interpretation about it but when law is being created they have certain objectives in mind so what is objective theory what is in the back of mind of the legislature then the same law is notified comes before the public public has its own views then comes the executive branch who implements the law they have their own theory of interpretation then dispute arises then it goes to judiciary they have different things in back of their mind that is why canada is a common law country we are to go by the written laws but judges also makes law so with the league theories by which everybody is guided those are known as legal theories how laws are made or interpreted that is what the legal theories are very simple now if we are to become canadian lawyers we are to give nc exams we are to become barrister and solicitors we are to attend our clients we are to draft different petitions we are to present the arguments before the court we are to write the decisions we as lawyer need to write the decisions then everything requires legal theories different perspective of writing would lead to a different outcome different legal theory so one thing i will keep you with abreast with the extra knowledge one thing i mentioned that you need to write the decisions let me say you one astonishing fact in canada who writes the judgment These are not the judges. Generally speaking, 
I'm not giving you the whole paraphernalia of Canadian law, but I am saying, generally speaking, in judges in Canada, judges do not write the judgment. Lawyers write the judgment. Lawyers are writing the judgment. Those they need to be guided by some theory. Some theories we will be reading just now. Others will be ideas in the back of what they are saying. That is why Canadian judiciary is less burdened, despite having so much of litigation, because judges do not have the work to, big work of writing the judgments, lawyers write the judgments. And one lawyer writes the judgment, another lawyer makes the objections, and once a lawyer is writing a judgment, they have basic theory in their mind what to write, what not to write, because they know that the other lawyer is going to make objections and this judgment should hold good for times to come. So they are very crispy in writing the judgment. Of course, if you go for the normal cases, you will have cyclostyled. Cyclostyled is an old word. Photocopy, that is also an old word. Copied. What should I call it as format judgment? Having, say, if you have a definite period of separation, you can have a decree of divorce. It means that is a set law. Then you can have judgment based upon that. So we were talking about legal theory apart from having an extra knowledge. Legal theory is what is working in everybody's mind. The examiner or the NCA has asked us to learn five legal theories. First is legal positivism. You can jot down. We have read the syllabus. Now these are in my words. First is legal positivism. Second is natural law. Third is critical legal theory. Fourth is feministic legal theory. Fifth is love economics. We are broadly dividing this chapter into five parts. Legal positivism, natural law, critical legal theory, feminist legal theory, law of economics. So far, so good. Do you have any question? Still, I ask you, you can unmute any yourself and ask me question or stop me in between. You are most welcome. Now, let us talk about legal positivism. You are going on a road. Speed limit is 100 km per hour. You are driving the vehicle. When police officer approaches you, your sp speed is 102 km per hour. Should it be an offense? Please answer. Anybody can answer, volunteer. Yes, sir. Why so? Because speed limit is 100 km per hour. 102 is quite normal. Can you have your foot on the accelerator and say that 102 I suppose it's quite normal. But rule is rule, sir. Okay. You are good. Very good. Thank you. Rule is rule. So this is legal point. I agree with the lady. The point is rule is rule is rule. This is the basic principle comprised in this theory. This theory is based in on the principle that rule is a rule is a rule. So rule is a rule is a rule. 102, you must get it. Good. Then is to enter in a casino, say for the sake of argument, 
is 18 years. You are about to reach 18 years. Rule is a rule. You have not reached 18 years. You are not allowed to enter. So rule is a rule is a rule. Simple theory, simple, nothing to worry about. If there is a written law, law says that rule is a rule is a rule. You have to follow the rule. This is something legal theory. Which legal theory we are talking about? So legal positivism. Good. I forgot. Anyway, legal positivism is a rule, is a rule, is a rule. Now, the case law which you need to mention in the exam is novel and bond. I have mentioned in my notes, simply Noble and Wolf is a, where if there is a restrictive covenant, then that is to be implemented. Law or covenant, condition between the two parties, may be written in the past, then that needs to be implemented. One another thing which I would like to mention over here, John Austin has described that law is made by the sovereigns to rule the state. So law should be followed. I have written my notes in fancy words, you will get it, no need to worry. But John Austin in legal positivism gave his views in its in this theory sphere. So what we have read? We have read topic, legal positivism. We have read an author, John Austin. What he says exactly, I can quote, but I have made you to understand. Then we have talked about a case law. Novel versus bond. Of course, I'm going to tell you what was contained in that case so that you may memorize. Once novel versus bond come to your mind, you may be able to recall in the exam that what is contained in that. There was one lot in which the restrictive covenant was that whenever this land will be sold, this will not be sold to the people belonging to described religions. It will not be sold to Jews. It will not be sold to Herbius, Semitics, or Negro. Once any noble was the name of the lady purchased a cottage, a lot for a cottage, lot, a lot means to say land, land for the cottage, there was a restrictive covenant written that whenever it will be sold, it will not be sold to the persons of Jewish, Arbu, Semitic, Negro religions, or you can sell it to anybody else. After a few years, this case pertains to 1948. So in 1948, she decided to sell it to Bernard Ball. That is why the case name is Noble and Ball, who was a Jewish person. She wanted to sell that house or land. Bernard Wolf wanted to purchase this land. But restricted covenant came in between that this land cannot be sold to a Jewish person. Bernard Wolf was a Jewish person. The matter went to the court and the judge decided that since there is a restrictive covenant which was written at the time of the purchase of the land by any noble as such, 
she is not allowed to sell it to wolf so the sale was disallowed this is something called as novel and wolf 1948 where restrictive covenant were held valid well. what was the idea behind it why the judge disallowed was there was written law written covenant between the parties if suppose i have a contract with you i have a written contract with you or an oral contract with you then the conditions of our contract becomes the law for both of us then either we can be flexible or we can be very straight forward as far as agreement reached between us between you and me what is this theory this theory is called as even positivism rule is a rule is a so always remember rule is a rule is a rule is the principle of legal positivism who are very very strict about the written principles of you cannot deviate a little 100 is okay if you are going 98 is okay below 100 is okay because speed limit is up to 100 but if you are going beyond 100 even 1 km you are to get ticket this is rule is a rule is a rule so any number of examples can be given am i clear on one theory anybody has got any question no sir clear anyway i suppose if you remember all the concept step by step it seems that this is very easy but once we go to chapter number 2 chapter number 3 and immediately if i revert back to chapter number 1 and ask you what is positivism was in like uh, syllabus it is written as positivism i have named it as legal positivism legal positive theory then it may become difficult so once it will be the intermixing of different concepts or foundations then you may find it difficult but once the concept is clear in your mind which i am trying to make then it will be a cake walk for all of you in the exam other will be like fighting with themselves to find out the appropriate answer to the question given in the exam you will be having everything in your mind you are to just take it out from your brain and put it on the paper in our case since exams are online we are to type it on the computer that's all now let us move to second natural law simple morality is the first principle okay laws are written good very good what difference it makes if it goes to 102 if it goes to 104 okay if you go to 110 it seems quite unreasonable speed limit is 100 km per hour 102 104 105 6 7 8 one may argue that what will be the criteria then i say little deviation to the countries where little deviation is possible even a traffic even if the machine shows that you were driving the vehicle at 106 and he takes the natural law view point he may suppose you have broken the written law but still you are near to that but if you are going beyond 110 15 then he is about to give you to what i am trying to say say enter entry age limit is 
18 years into the casino. Four days are left. Five days are left. Okay. 17 years, 360 days is my age. Four friends are going. And security guard was to see the date of birth of everyone. Of course, if I'm going, he's not to check my date of birth. It's, it is automatically clear to him that I am above 18 years of age. But if a young guy goes, then the security man on the gate may not be sure that whether I am above 18 or not, then he would like to see my identity card. And I am 17 years, 360 days. He allows me to enter the casino. If tomorrow he is cross-examined, he is cross-questioned, that how you allowed him to enter into the casino, his, lay, his age was less than 18 years. And whether he should be punished the security guard for allowing a person of less than 18 years? No. He will say, sir, I have checked his age. He was 17 years, 360 days, and I thought it appropriate to allow him to enter into the casino. Okay, good. It seems that he has violated the written law, but whether it is a real violation, the answer is no. If we are guided by the legal positive rule is a rule is a rule, then he should be punished. He has, he must not have done it. Now, I say that discretion lies with the security guard. What is this? Situation remains to be the same. Only the things in the back of our mind have changed. The theory which is forcing us to take the decision have changed. Now it's a natural law theory. Natural law theory says you should be flexible while taking your decisions. Morality first is the principle enshrined in this. So natural law theory says that, of course, the laws are written. Even if we go behind the common laws, the judgments are written by the courts. But one can have its own interpretation or one can be little flexible. While implementing the law. So what I am trying to say, there is a basic difference between the two theories, legal positivism and natural law theory. You might have understood by the time. Now let us talk about a case law, Drummond Red, D-R-U-M-M-O-N-D, Drummond Red, W-R-E-N. Now let me say you very, very honestly, with all humility at my command that names may be mispronounced by me during the whole of the teachings. Why so? Because these are not usual names. These are names generally, generally speaking, pertaining to the Aboriginal people who were even having different sorts of languages. Herbu was H. Herbu, H-E-R-B-R-E-W. Herbu was one of the language of the Aboriginals, which is hardly finds any place in the world languages. So the names are in those languages. We have tried to written those names in the English. So either you can have the reference of your notes, or uh, but still you should have something in your mind. So never go for the pronunciation. You can either memorize the like uh, spellings or you can have reference material with you in the exam. And thanks to NCA who has allowed us, otherwise it would have been very difficult to memorize these names. Raman Ren is the names. Similar are the facts like were in which case we studied. Anybody can recall legal positivism? Without seeing the notebook, please. That much I can ask. Novel versus? Bolson. Good. Raman Ren. Why I repeat time and again? I have told you the spelling. Still I am repeating. This is not good at my 
no i tell you again if you listen in class time and again it may strike in your mind once you are writing in the exam because we are going to make it a routine habit during our classes so there was a welfare organization who purchased a land and the similar stipulation was there this case held before noble and wolf noble and wolf held in 1948 drummond ran held in 1945 so both the theories were going on during the similar time same times till date these are going on so the case law pertains to 1945 drummond ran one welfare organization namely wea purchased one land one land the same were the covenant then whenever you will be selling this uh, land you will not be selling to a Jew or a person of objectionable nationality. If anybody has attended, most of you might have attended my yesterday's class. I was talking about right to equality under Article, sorry, under Section Fifteen of the Charter. Here I am talking about person of objectionable nationality. That is the fun of talking. At least remember, Constitution at the time of Constitution, Foundation at the time of Foundation, the covenant was that land cannot be sold to a Jew or a person of objectionable nationality. Once you start taking the foundation, criminal or anything in connection with your day-to-day -day life, it will be very easy for you people to appear in the exam and write. So the covenant was objectionable nationality. Once you will come to objectionable nationality word, wherever you are in the life, you will be recalled of Drummond Ren and W E A who were not to sell their land to these people, and the judge decided allowed. You can sell it. Of course, it is written covenant, but. The land is sold for the welfare. W A needed the money. The judge conceptualized the circumstances existed between the parties and allowed that Drummond Ren, who belonging to the uh, what should I call it as of a objectionable nationality, it can be sold that land, and the sale was allowed. That's all. somebody was asking me in my previous batch individually that why we discuss the whole of the facts i asked him one particular question and he or she was convinced that we need to write two or three lines in the exam do we have time to write more and more the answer is no then what is the fun of reading we should know the crux of the matter we should write it one says that i am very studious i want to know the whole of the facts how the things developed what were the facts what the judge what the petitioner said what the respondent said what the judge argued what the judge given the supporting arguments in favor of its judgment and whether there was a dissenting opinion or not then let me suggest you once you will get my notes the case name will be there you can search that case name read the whole case but that is not useful for the purpose of your nca exam because in my notes i have followed a theory i give facts in brief i give decision in brief and i give take away ratio of the case i suppose the ratio of the case is sufficient to write in the exam and at certain places i have not since the whole of the concept brought by me in the my notes is very short so the decision becomes the ratio you can pick up any single line use it in your answer and get the marks that is what you are looking for in your exam so we are done with two theories legal positivism natural law one may come to the conclusion after listening to all of this thing okay these were two theories if we go into any of the public law books there will be approximately not less than 15 to 20 pages written on these 
are we leaving anything? The answer is no. You need not to worry about anything. Otherwise, there are research papers available on the internet. You can study as many as you need. So let me see you anything that you should be having a bird eye approach. Not only for the whole of your exam, but whenever you are reading a concept, you have to pick up that material, put it into your notes. Rather, I would go a step further. You can highlight my notes. The lines which you find more useful in your exam, you can write it down. Let me say you, let me disclose one of my theories, personal theory, that when I was studying NCA, I used to write few lines, few words in my notebook. But when I had to write the notes for you people, I had to again search the whole of the articles I have gone through. Then I picked up few words because I needed to write few more, more and more lines for you people. So I have tried to be more elaborative, but still these are very crispy material available to you for the purpose of the exam. Anything from the two legal theories so that we may proceed further to critical legal theories. So far, so good. Let us go ahead. I will be very fast in the days to come for the simple reason. Today, I need to tell my methodology, the NCA's requirements and other things. And daily, we will be concentrating upon the topic itself. And whatsoever I am telling you today, being the first class, please take all these things in your mind for all classes and also in your exam. Repetition, you may not like, I may not have the time, but still you are welcome to ask me anything, but please, please, please take all the things from the very first class with you up to the passing of your exam, at least up to the writing of your exam. Passing is the prerogative. To make you pass is the prerogative of the examination. I'm going here and let us talk about critical legal. Do I do criticism of anybody? No. I'm very crystal clear. I have a bird eye approach. I have told you about legal positivism. Then I have told you about natural law. But now critical. I'm not doing anybody's criticism. Even I'm not doing my own criticism. Then why we are reading critical legal theory? Part of our syllabus, critical legal studies. Part of our life. Judge has not made a right decision. He is taken away by the other counsel. He was biased. He used his personal judgment. These are the remarks which are generally made. He do not know the law. He or she, please forgive me, I am not making, I am not pronouncing any single category of people. He may be having bad views about the particular topic in his own life. That is why he has given this judgment. But we all are doing by making these sort of remarks. They may be true, they may not be true, they may be correct, they may be incorrect, but we are doing criticism all the times. I do not know you. You all people may be very, very intelligent, super duper intelligent than me. Then I do not have any right to make self-observation about you people. I always say that you may commit this error, that error, you may be thinking in the back of your mind, why this guy has got this, who has given this guy a right to conclude about ourselves? We are very good. We are not to make these sort of errors. We are perfect. He's self-obsessed. 
again criticism you are doing of mine as i am doing of yours you are doing of mine this is what is critical legal theory he is biased he might have taught those students who were not good that is why he is carrying that sort of impression on the back of his mind he is telling again and again he is the habit of he is in the habit of repeating the things what is the fun of teaching in this way you are doing my criticism i am doing your criticism we are doing judges criticism judges are doing lawyers criticism critical legal theory means that we all have got certain biases within us judges we can be talking about judge made laws Judge, judgments are generally overruled earlier the supreme court might have got about the same topic about the same point about the same thing let me give you one instance one is suffering from a serious disease he wants to die he wants that his doctor her doctor should help her in dying supreme court said no 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 as a doctor your life your duty is to save the life of your patient you are not allowed to assist him in his in his or her dying now what the canadian supreme court says he is suffering too much he cannot live his wish is to die doctor can help so supreme court has overruled its own viewpoint Same is the what has changed. The time has changed. The viewpoints have changed. The legal theories have changed. So it is always an evolving process based on the facts of the society. Earlier we used to write the letters. I have written my viewpoint in the writing. put it into the post box sent to mail then it will reach you after 4 days in 4 days your opinion might have changed but my opinion will be read by you after 4 days you may have your own view point but by that time my view point has also changed but in 2 days time email just click send mail is gone my view point has gone to you with the fraction of a second or in 2 seconds that is why more fights are there because we do not give time to each other i am criticizing you you are criticizing me we are on the zoom you are listening me i am listening you i am less listening you you are criticizing me i am criticizing you this is something known as critical legal theory why i am stressing so upon it because generally people say what is critical legal theory critical legal theory is a theory which is says that law is necessarily intertwined with social issues so there cannot be a stable view point on any of the given topics social biases are there to exist inherent views are there to exist and every person has got its own view points but those view points keeps on changing see the law was made in 1940 the makers of the law the legislature have different view point and generally we say now the time has changed this law should be interpreted in the contemporary times in different manner this is what is known as theory this is what is nca is looking for 
everybody is copying my material, somebody other's material, putting into before the NCA. But if you are going before the NCA, giving the crux of your own thinking about the critical legal theory, about any other topic, then NCA would be very happy if after copying or changing a little bit of my notes, NCA is giving me five marks, you may be getting seven marks out of 10, or you may be getting 10 out of 10 because you have an original idea to tell to the examiner. I have written notes, but please, please, please do not concentrate upon the written words. Develop your own words as per the requirement of the question. Because I told you that legal theories will be all over. We have read legal positivism. We have read life of that. Natural law theory. Then we have also read critical law. Case name, you can write it down, R versus RDS. Name is simple, R versus RDS, 1997. There is always a reasonable apprehension of bias. If we view the matter practically or realistically, we may have different opinions. That is what I have spoken right away, which is very much correct. What I have written, there is a risk. Now I am reading. There is a reasonable apprehension of bias if an informed person viewing the matter realistically and practically and having thought the matter through would conclude that there is a one. Difficult to remember. But whatsoever I have told you, that is very, very easy to remember about the critical view. Before I tell you about the facts of the case, any questions? Some people do ask me that in how much classes you will be completing the syllabus. In first class itself, our first chapter, which is all over foundation, which can be used in every question will be done to. Now let us talk about R versus RDS. A case held in 1997, a young black man, black man faced criminal charges. He told something about a person, then to the police officer, of course. He was like, uh, um, uh, a person was, uh, what we call it as, uh, robbed by a certain black persons. That is what her uh, statement was. Then the police officer who were having their own viewpoint, found certain black persons due to black racism. And those black persons, one gun was found from them, certain things which were found from them, they had to face that trial. Then the judge made the comments. Judge told that uh, Judge told that some police officers have got racism in them. Of course, this was a biased comment. Then the Crown went in appeal before the Supreme Court. And once the Crown went into appeal, based on the point that the judge was biased, what was the bias that police officer? have got racism for black people. So the Crown went into appeal and told the court that judge was biased. Judge was not impartial. So his judgment should be set aside. The Supreme Court took the cognizance of the fact and set aside that. I have written the uh, like facts and the ratio as well as the decision in fancy words, but this is all about this case. Uh, Novel versus Ball, Drum and Dren, then comes this R versus RDS. 
the i remember time please do have in your mind any questions before we go to feminist legal theory okay feminist yes, okay thank you and feminist legal theory can be divided into two parts early feminism contemporary feminism early feminism women were not allowed to vote then they were allowed to vote contemporary feminism women were not allowed to do abortions now the women are allowed to do abortions at their sweet will that's all about the feminist legal theory this is one way of doing the thing early feminism the persons case is there contemporary feminism morgan taylor's case is why i make long talk, short talks big longer for the simple reason because you have to appear in the exam here you will be only recalled of the concepts which we will which we have well studied in the class and let me recall my own experience i'm not talking about foundation in my barrister exam which was one of the toughest of the time in june questions were too lengthy answers there is one uh, in barrister exam the answers you have to pick the out of four options multiple choice so earlier when we were appearing in nca we were thinking that this exam is not good descriptive that will be good we cleared nca then we reached to barrister solicitor then mcqs multiple choice questions appeared to be super duper tough we were thinking those will be easy answers are there we have to pick one but picking of the one out of the four was really a hercules task so let me say you the thing which helped us helped me at least i am really indebted to my teacher i i com uh, complimented my teacher when i came out of the exam after clearing after completing my barrister exam that ma'am my teacher was a lady teacher that ma'am your words were really striking into my mind once i was choosing the options i so because she made us well versed with the conceptuals concepts maybe procedural concepts maybe subjective concepts maybe objective concepts so what i am trying to tell you people the things which you learn in the class not only go with you for the purpose of the exam but go throughout your life you will remember my words once you will be standing before the judge before the honorable supreme court of canada i wish for all of you that you should soon become the canadian lawyers and you should appear before the canadian supreme court that is a dream of every lawyer to argue before the supreme court of canada then if your studies come daily across you then it means your teachers were successful so that is how my teachers are successful your teacher may i be successful that time may be let us talk about feminist legal theory this chapter is little this chapter not not this chapter this subject is little orthodox i would call it you will criticize today because you have read critical legal why orthodox sir we like it very much you have your own opinion we have your our own opinion you are guided by some other legal theory we are guided by no other legal theory the matter is done dear friends why the matter is done you are reading an exam question different theories are coming before you and you know which theory you are to bring in this if at all you need to bring my job is done now let us talk about feminist legal the all over the world this was a general concept that the women were not given their dues women were not allowed to vote women were not to participate in the uh, law making process women cannot be become the senators women could not become the members of the parliament 
what to talk of becoming the members of the parliament when they were not allowed to vote. We are talking about Canada. We are talking of early families. They were not allowed to vote. We always say these are the developed countries. Okay. In Canada too. We never know. This is something astonishing. We thought it was only in this third world countries. But in Canada too, women were not allowed to vote. Okay. But it means juries went, social structures went from the same phenomena from time to time, little early or little late, throughout the world. Maybe developed countries, maybe underdeveloped countries, maybe third world countries, maybe dependent countries, maybe developing countries. So we were talking about feminist legal theory. Feminist legal theory is talking about early feminism. We can split it into two parts for the purpose of our study up to the year 1918, approximately a century ago. Women were not allowed to vote in Canada. Then one bill came which gave the right Women's Suffrage Act. In the year 1918, which allowed the women to vote. So, once Canadian scholar, namely Sharon Hamilton, we can call it as Hamilton, he told that five petitions by the five government from 1917 to 1927 suggested that women should be given the right to vote. But no senator were happy with it. So who allowed it? The Honorable Supreme. What happened was there was one act, British North America Act, DNA Act, we call it, 1867. There was word used as qualified person. Case name is Edward versus AG Canada commonly known as person's case. So the point in question is, women were not allowed to vote. They were allowed to vote by the year 1918 by the way of women's suffrage vote. Now the next question was that whether they can be senators. Everybody tried, but nobody wanted that they should have to share the number of senators at two equal number with the women. So no government in five years, uh, in sorry, 10 years, five successive government never could able to make it. The point was there was one British North America Act, BNA Act of 1867 in which the definition was of qualified person that only the qualified persons can become the senator. Now, when this matter went to the Honorable Supreme Court that what it means to be a qualified person, whether the qualified person only pertains to male or it also includes female. Then the Honorable Supreme Court held that the word qualified person do include female. So the Supreme Court made remarks that it is a DNA Act or any other act is a living tree capable of growth. I have put these words in my notes. And 
because of this case, this is known as Persons case, early feminism, Persons case held in the year 1939. By the time in 1918, women were allowed to vote. And after 20 years, approximately 20 years, the women were allowed to be senators by adding the interpretation of the words qualified person to include females as well as given by the Honorable Supreme Court. Canadian Supreme Court. Section 24. Person also includes the females. And with early, earlier feminism, two things we have. One thing is women were allowed to vote in 1918. Women were allowed to be senator in the year 1939. Case name is Edward versus A.G. Canada. A.G. means many a times in case quotations it will come A.G. Canada as attorney general. Edward versus A.G. Canada, 1939, commonly known as Persons case. Edward versus A.G. Canada, 1939, qualified person, women were allowed to vote. No, women were allowed to be senators. That is Women's Suffrage Act, 1918, by which women were allowed to vote. What we were reading? Feminist theory. Good. I still remember. So what I am trying to say is you have to remember where we were. I told you in the first chapter itself we will be reading six case laws given by the three case laws given by the NCA meaning thereby nine case laws. But don't worry you will have the access to your material. In the exam as well. We are reading fourth theory, feminist theory, and uh, we have read one part of it, early feminism. Step by step development. Women were not allowed to wait 1980. Women were al allowed to be senator 1939 by Edward versus A.G. Canada. Then came the contemporary feminism. Lot has been done, lot has been said, lot has been contested. Who are the are the women property? That somebody else is to decide about that. Whether the women are competent to carry photos in their womb or not. Whether they have got right for self-right for abortions. And who is to decide? This is something in the late 20th century. Women said, we should be given the right of self-decision making. See, I told you again, and you were thinking this is prevalent in third world countries. We are talking about late 20th century. We are talking about Canada. We have come from South Africa, we have come from Pakistan, we have come from India, we have come from New Zealand. Very sorry state of affairs. Let me say you time and again legal theories or legal scenarios or the overall scenarios throughout the world travel together. Little later or later earlier. So what I am trying to tell you, somebody comes, somebody goes, that is why I have to click mouse time and again, little diversion, never mind, R versus Morgan Tales. Morgan Tales, 1988, 1918, 1939, 1988, R versus Morgan Tales. This is a landmark decision by the Supreme Court in which the Supreme Court held that Section 251 of the Criminal Code, like we have other laws in our home jurisdictions, we have Criminal Code, which is a federal law in Canada. 
yesterday whosoever have attended the class of uh, constitution might have talked about section 7 right to life liberty and security section 251 is violative of section 7 of the canadian charter of rights this was decided by the case of r versus morgan tales 1988 and section 251 subsection 1 was struck down because that section was not giving right to the woman of self decision making and doctors were not allowed to do the abortions on asking of the woman but this judgment paved the way for this particularly in this case the justice wrote that the pregnant woman can not be compelled can be compelled by law to carry a fortress to town means to say that whether a pregnant woman can be compelled by law to carry a fortress to town means to say once she becomes a pregnant once she becomes pregnant she has to give birth to a child. If she do not want the child, then who has the right for decision making? The woman has the right to make this. This was decided in the year 1988 and the abortions decision by the woman was allowed by the Honorable Supreme of Canada. Done with the contemporary feminism. So, this theory we have split up in two segments, two subtopics. We have done four theories. Are we good? Or any questions, please? Yes, sir. Good. So, which, which provision was struck down? 258 one? 251, subsection one. Thank because you. it was violable or uh, violative of section 7 of the Constitution Act, you know, Charter of Rights and Freedom. Section 7, we are to read. Life, liberty, and security. But still, we are in the foundation clause. I will talk about law and economics, the fifth theory of the First chapter we are reading, fifth theory we are reading, law and economics. Simple, very simple. Value of money increases or increases with the time? Increases. We have to do the balancing act at the time the judgment is made. Whenever the judgment is made, the judgment should give, the judge should give the judgment according to the, as far as value of the money is concerned, when the judgment is made, not when the case was filed. Many a times it has been seen that the cases are decided after so many years, years together cases go in the court for trial or for something else case conferences, pre-trial conferences, or something else. But what court says that the value of the money, court should do a balancing act. Court should not only see that when, what is the value of the money when the case was filed. The court should also see value of the money when the case was signed. The judgment to be quoted in Bank of America versus Mutual Trust Fund. Year 2002. In this Bank of America given a loan to certain developers. Developers of who made houses and all that. And by the time 
real estate market collapsed. In 1998-1999 in Canada, the real estate market collapsed. So the houses could not be sold. They were under heavy debt. They could not return the money of Bank of America. They took loan to the tune of $10 million. Canadian dollars. So now the point is then whenever the judge needs to decide about the return of money by those developers to Bank of America, the developers were of the opinion that they should only return the principal along with simple interest. Because that was the law. But if the court would have used this law and economics theory, the court would have seen the Bank of America propagated, went into appeal against the trial court judgment that it should not be a simple interest which should be awarded. It should be a compound interest which should be awarded. And believe me, compound interest in this case would make a difference of $5 million. Only if the court helps it that the interest should be compounded, then the difference of amount, the value of money was to the difference of the value of money was to the tune of $5 million, which was a huge amount for Bank of America. So the court decided based on law and economics that the value of the money should be made equally be, uh, sorry, equally that the balance of money means to say equilibrium should be created. It is not that by the passage of the time, even after contesting the case, Bank of, Bank of America should lose major part of its money to the tune of $5 million. So what the judge gave by applying the law and economics theory that compound interest should be paid by the developers to the Bank of America for the return of the money. So this is what this theory is. Bank of America, Canada, Bank of America, Canada means to say Bank of America was having a branch in Canada. That is why it is called Bank of America, Canada versus Mutual Trust Company. Mutual Trust Company was the company of some developers who used to make houses. They were builders. Any questions, please? We have completed the chapter except the article and the case laws. Something has been done. Okay, let us move to R versus Morris. You have your printed slavers, even if you do not have, kindly write down. R versus Morris, number one. Where R versus Morris is there, you should put number one. First case. On the left hand side, you should write it as first and second, both. You can write anti black racism. Anti black racism. Now come on the right hand side. Left hand side means to say this part where my finger is. Right hand side is this part. We take this as written part. Left hand side is this part. Right hand side is this part. These are the keywords we are writing. You may write your own keywords, but as a teacher, my duty is to jot down you my own understanding, which is anti black racism. These both judgments are based on anti-black racism. R versus Morris 2021 judgment. Right hand side, write down sentencing case, sentencing case framework.
second judgment right hand side left hand side we have written for both the judgment anti black racism on right hand side for second judgment kindly write down landlord tenant Let us discuss R versus Marx. Astinder, are you there? Yes, sir. So Astinder helps me. She is my old student. She uh, have to appear in the because her assessment has just come. So she has got my notes. I would request her to read kindly R versus Morris. R versus Morris, 2021, Ontario Court of Appeal. Sentencing framework for indigenous offenders does not apply to black offenders. The appellate court's powerful declaration is made with the aim of anti-black racism being acknowledged, confronted, mitigated, and ultimately erased. The bitter question answered in the case at hand is, how should trial judges take into consideration evidence of anti-black racism at the sentencing stage of a criminal prosecution? So this is the crux of the matter I have written down, which uh, Sinder have just read in the very beginning. I suppose this is sufficient. But if there is an independent question confronting you in the NCA exams, I have also written down facts as well as the law involved, section 718.2 is involved, then the decision. We will be reading just the crux part, rest I will be making you clear, but still for the first, because it is a first case, that is why we are reading the whole facts, so that you may know that how we are doing it. It will take two to three minutes. Sinder, kindly read facts. You sure, please sir. listen carefully. Fact. Sinder, please read slowly. Sure, sir. Fact. In 2014, police were contacted by a man who claimed that he had been the victim of a home invasion and described the robbers as a poor black man. In response to plainclothes officers in unmarked vehicles located four black men walking in a parking lot that happened to be in the vicinity of the robbery, one of the men was Mr. Calvin Morris, who when approached, attempted to flee and subsequently ran into an officer's vehicle. Mr. Morris then scaled a fence and ran into the parking lot of a no frills grocery store where officers continued their pursuit. Mr. Morris then ducked into a stairwell and removed his jacket, whereupon he, the accused, was apprehended. Police later recovered from this stairwell a jacket which contained a loaded 38 Smith and Wesson handgun. So this is these are the facts of the case. Why I am reading just because you can come to know that we have the detailed facts in our hand of a single case which has been prescribed by the NC. Of course, these may be consisting of many pages. Sometimes it is consisting of 10 pages, we have made it short. But these are of less requirement. This is, these are just for your understanding purpose. What was the scenario? Otherwise, we are constrained up to the principle, which was read by Stender in first few lines. Then we have, wherever possible, wherever the law needs to be quoted, section 7182, we have taken from the criminal code, which reads a code that imposes a Sentence shall also take into consideration the following principle. All available sanctions other than imprisonment that are reasonable in the circumstances and consistent with the harm done to the victims or to the community should be considered for all offenders with particular attention to the circumstances of Aboriginal offenders. In this section of the criminal code, the law is like this, if an Aboriginal is informed, he should not be sentenced in the same fashion, in the same manner in which a normal Canadian is sentenced. He should be given certain, he should be dealt with his circumstantial sympathetic aptitude. That is the objective of putting the section 7182 
subsection E in the criminal code. So this is something regarding the sentencing framework. But that what the decision was given, kindly send the read. Decision. The trial judge's task in sentencing is to impose a just sentence tailored to the individual offender proportionately to one, the gravity of the offense and two, the degree of responsibility of the offender. Social context evidence relating to the offender's life experiences may be used where relevant to mitigate the offender's degree of responsibility for the offense. When assessing the offender's degree of personal responsibility, an offender's experience with anti-Black racism does not impact on the seriousness or gravity of the offense. The trial judge erred in this regard. Just a moment. The, you... the point in question is that what the judge is, if you go by, this is something sentencing methodology. If you are a practicing lawyer, even, even in your home jurisdiction, you know, the judge always hears on the point of sentence. These are the factors which I have been described over here are the basis of giving the punishment or considering that what sort of sentence after declaring the offender as an accused as a uh, accused as an offender, the judge should take into consideration certain factors. But this section says if he is a original, then certain different methodology should be adopted. But whether that holds good in the case of anti-black racism, the answer is no. If a black offender is there, white offender is there, any offender is there, except Aboriginal offender, then the GLADU methodology, which is next judgment, uh, that should not have any impact. Please read the last lines so that we may conclude. Ontario Court of Appeal no, found no, that the GLADU trials, methodology, the GLADU the GLADU methodology. methodology, the GLADU methodology does not apply to black offenders. However, that jurisprudence can, in some respect, inform the approach to be taken when assessing the impact of anti-black racism on sentencing. Ontario Court of Appeal found that trial judge could have imposed a sentence ranging from a sentence at or near the maximum reformatory term to a penetratory sentence of three years. So what I'm trying to say over here in this whole of the judgment, if I am to sum up this judgment, whether anti-black racism or black people should be afforded the uh, framework as given for the Aboriginal people, the answer given in this judgment was, Big no. Of course, the, whenever the court need, takes into consideration the other circumstances of the offender, those can be taken into account as in any other case. So this is what this judgment is and carry away of the judgment I have written. So if you have to use this judgment during any of the exam question, you can always use a takeaway. If there is an independent question, you can use the whole of it. Now come to the next that is landlord tenant case. We are here to read it. Please read. Then the only the landlord tenant case. case. Judicial note of anti-black racism in Canada needs to be taken. What is in existence should be brought on record, howsoever indirect that might be. The Ontario Court of Appeal took judicial notice of anti-black racism and factored in racial prejudice on the part of landlord to grant a tenant the equitable remedy of relief from forfeiture. Now let me say you about two judgments. First judgment is about anti-black racism about sentencing case framework in the criminal law. How criminal law anti-black or black racism should not impact in any manner in avoiding the sentence that is what we have generally read. Except that we have read in thorough detail. But as far as in civil, whether the same methodology holds good in civil law itself? The answer is yes. So in this case, what happened is there was a clause. One company was tenant who was dealing into some food stuff, making some food stuff for a particular community were having a lease term. 
and whenever they had it uh, they have a covenant attached to it the covenant was that whenever the lease is approaching to be ex near to expiry they have to inform the landlord 6 months prior to the conclusion of the lease that they want to continue with the lease they forgot but they forgot to inform the landlord that they want to continue but when 5 months left they were trying to approach to the landlord the landlord avoided them because the landlord knew that they have already taken uh, they already could not fulfill the requisite condition enshrined in the their uh, lease deed but when he filed an affidavit before the trial court he used that these black so when he filed an affidavit he written a line in that that which was showing his intention that these black people do in this man so he never tried to listen to them because he wanted to get rid of their lease he wanted that they should vacate the premises so he used that clause failure to comply with that clause against the tenants but when the matter went before the court the court did, did not take notice of it and told that this lease should terminate then matter went up to the honorable supreme court honorable supreme court while taking the cognizance of that affidavit in which it was written there that he was not behind the fact that he they have violated the terms of the lease but he wanted to vacate the land because he was against the black people so which was not accepted so the court held that even if they could not fulfill the covenant as enshrined in the lease deed so it should not be because the landlord has committed an error by not by putting in on paper that he wanted to get rid of these black people why so because the court said court held why this case is important because the court held that if any anything this sort of come on paper even before the civil court in canada then that should be takenly taken very seriously and the person who is doing that should not be given benefit of it this wrong so the case was decided against the land and they were allowed to continue the lease just because he used this language in this so what i am trying to say this both cases pertains to anti black racism so this question can be asked in many forms one form can be in what circumstances should a case take judicial notice of anti black racism in canada this can be one question don't worry i will give you in notes is there a principled basis to consider and not consider anti black racism or are societal realities pertaining to black business people always to be taken into account or is this question asked for giving pro and uh, os uh, opinion of yours is there a third third way of asking this question is is there a requirement to provide evidence of unconscious bias and if so how is this demonstrated see we read the last question is there a requirement to provide evidence of unconscious bias and if so how is this demonstrated now let us read this one line you need to bring this Eight five seven three one two three Canadian Incorporation versus Shefford Plaza Incorporation. Into picture, write few lines in the short answer type question and get the full marks, which is in your pocket. Done. This is the benefit of studying. This is the benefit of reading. Once you have concept in your mind, we have written, we have read certain theories. now we have read two cases i have 
made you to write anti black racism then i have made you to write sentence case paper then i have made you to write landlord tenant case and let me give you my own experience when i was teaching my last batch when i put when i took out the syllabus sender is witness to this whenever i have to read this landlord tenant case shefford plaza i was recalled of the principal i was recalled of the facts i was recalled of the whole of these three question which i have just read so that is why i was asking i am asking that you should carry this syllabus with you not only in the class but also in the once this much of keywords you can use your own keywords i have used my own which recalls me about the whole case when 30 cases will be with you and you have keywords written on the exam and of course there are other uses of this syllabus as well rule out theory we will be discussing later on rule out theory whenever you will be reading a question how you need to rule out there is nothing from chapter 1 nothing from chapter 2 how we need to do that that is the best methodology to attempt the foundation law exam we will learn that but for the time being i am here to tell that you need to jot down few things which i need to tell you during each class during the study of each case law so let me say you in the end of our class one case has been left out which we will be taking in second class of course the article as well because we are running short of time due to the fact that we have covered few more things other than first chapter in this class and next time onwards we will be very stick to our schedules and to our learnings as well because a lot of things are there to cover and let me say you one thing in the last if you study well for these two hours in each class and then go to home once you will have the notes then you study those notes and don't make rush in the last hours don't put yourself in trouble for the last few days or few hours then you are good to go for foundation law my methodology is that you study well in the class you listen carefully never sleep in the class i also do not sleep i suppose you all are witness to this fact you also shouldn't sleep then go to home study well and then you will be good no need to work. so if you spend two hours here one and a half hour or two hours on this chapter or three hours in two days say on this chapter at home the whole chapter is prepared done 10 times 10 in uh, let me inform you in foundation since it is lengthy we will have 13 to 15 classes and in 13 to 15 classes we will be completing the whole syllabus we will be writing the whole things on the paper and we will be using it in the exam on the syllabus itself and lastly we will be criticizing each other why so because we have to remember critical legal theory means to say we have to take into mind the concepts which we have learned over here into the exam and use them while answering the question many people do ask me that is it necessary to solve many many questions before we go to the exam i do not subscribe to this you may solve that is entirely your discretion but my way of thinking is if you have studied well with a methodology with a technique then you will be good to write even if you are studying the questions for the first time but please don't worry we will be attempting exam question as well by the end of our syllabus once we have completed the syllabus. but still i says 
once you have completed the syllabus thoroughly, you need not to do this. Anyway, before we end today's class, I have to give you some information. But before you give, I give you some that information. Do you have any question? Uh, sir, are these case laws related with the particular theory? Yes, I have dictated those case laws which are with the theories. You can understand yourself. Means to say, if you pick up any case law, <clears throat> Bank of America is only related with law and economics. Okay. Ramad Ren is related with natural law. There the judge held that uh, Covenant is not uh, necessary and it should be allowed. He debated from the written principle. In Nobber versus Wolf, he disallowed. Rule is a rule is a rule. Done. Person case in itself allowing to become the senators. What else is left out? One case in the contemporary feminism of abortions. Section 251, subsection 1. Violative of section 7 of the Canadian Charter done. Understand that all I have summed up in two minutes the whole of the chapter as well as the case laws uh, with the theories. Am I right? Thank you. Thank you. And anybody else? Any question? Every question is a good question. And I really like that uh, Dimple Sial has uh, posed a very good question. And let me inform you that this is the end of our first class, which is free of cost. And henceforth, uh, uh, whosoever will enroll with me, enroll with me, will be getting the whole notes for this uh, foundation. And we will be completing whole of the foundation's syllabus in 12 to 15 classes. We are aiming at exam for January 2023. I have the NCA schedule with me. Whosoever may want to appear in uh, January 2023 exam for both of the classes, Canadian Constitutional Law, Foundation of Canadian Law, we are aiming at January 2023. But if anybody is attempting for Gen uh, October 2023, 2022, he or she is also welcome. I will give her extra time. Moreover, this I will be charging 350 Canadian dollars as my fee for the entire syllabus of foundation and until you pass. God forbid you fail, I will be, you can attend next batch, next classes or one-to-one -one coaching because I will feel that you haven't failed, I have failed while I could not make you to write the appropriate answers in the exam. So one-to-one -one coaching will can also be there. God forbid I have to give to anybody. And you are most welcome to attend my next sessions. So my fee is until you pass. Fee I have told you 350 Canadian dollars. And rest, if any questions you have, you can ask. Before we end up today's class, Thank you very much to all of you. You all were wonderful. You have uh, given me patient hearing. You were good in asking little question. I, I want that you should be a little more vocal in the class. As much as you will be vocal, it will be, give me opportunity to explore about you and to know that where you stand for the purpose of exam. You can individually call me at any time, clear your doubts, but as a lawyer, I do feel that you should not be hesitant in asking the question in the class. But all of you are very good since you have given me your weekend two hours. And these two hours means a lot to me, should mean a lot to you as well. And I'm really very, very thankful. That's all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, bye bye. Take care. Take very good care. I'm stopping the recording as well as the class. Thank you. Bye bye.